The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Okay, so this is the session, the hot topic session on moisture and concrete slabs. Learning objectives for this today, uh, you as attendees will understand and recognize the changes in the construction market that all kind of start off with, with some EPA regulations and the amount of VOCs and flooring adhesives. And then we'll go into understanding why moisture uh, related flooring failures in floors occur some potential solutions, and how to essentially assess and measure the moisture content in concrete floors. So we have a, a real powerhouse of speakers here today. So we'll start off with myself talking about the problem a little bit and you know, kind of how it's come about in the last 10, 15 years, even though Peter and Ned were informing me today that they did a session about this similar topic, probably, or were in a session about 15 years ago. So it was still an issue then, but still an issue here today. Ned will come up and talk about moisture movement and concrete and uh, how to do the testing. And then Peter is going to come up, and I'm sure a lot of you know who Peter is. Peter's going to come up and do what he does and talk about all the solutions and, you know, be Peter. So I'm Ryan Hankensethkin. I am an engineer for Central Concrete. We're a ready-mix concrete producer in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we often get called in on some of these issues related to the moisture in the concrete floor from either our concrete subcontractor or from the general contractor. I actually had somebody lined up from DEFCON Construction in the Bay Area who does a lot of construction. In fact, I'll talk about them on one of their projects here shortly. A major general contractor, and the guy is the, the who heads up their superintendents, essentially, all their field work. And I, I, essentially, I talked to him and talked to him about what some of the problems are that, that he ran, runs into. And he's the one that essentially would have to deal with all the issues out on the job site and kind of gave me some pointers and his concerns from the general contractor perspective. So I'll talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about um, the, the issue of concrete moisture failures. And then we'll have these guys come up here and finish it off. So the real problem is when floors go bad. And you can see several pictures here. These are all actually all courtesy of Peter. Uh, and he could talk about the specifics of these projects, but I believe, Peter, this one was a, was an airport hangar. Is that right? Oh, you don't recognize that one? Okay, that one's not Peter's. I believe this one here on the left is an airport hangar. The second one from the left is actually some mold and mildew and some floor tiles. He has some bubbling on the one on the far right in a, in a gym. And what ends up happening is uh, the moisture in the concrete subfloor comes up into the adhesive, re-emulsifies the adhesive with the high pH of the the vapor that's coming up and the, the salts at the top surface of the concrete and you get these blistering issues. This ends up having to be uh, remediated, either the flooring tear it out and something put back in its place and it costs millions and millions of dollars each and every year. Now before the flooring is actually put down there is an, an issue of actually getting the moisture down in the concrete to a level that will accept the flooring and having the warranty of the flooring manufacturer, the adhesive manufacturer, and the flooring installer uh, valid. And what this ends up happening is we have these huge impacts to the owner. And some of these impacts are this flooring damage that I just showed you, the repairs to that, downtime on the project. The big thing on the construction side in new buildings is actually construction delays and cost overruns that are happening because the fact that you can't get the moisture down quick enough and you either have to wait for the concrete to dry, which right now in today's construction market is just not an option, or you have to put down some sort of moisture mitigation system. And a lot of times what ends up happening from the general contractor's perspective, the good ones actually put this in their bed, and they have a contingency put in there in case the moisture doesn't come down to the levels that we need, we're going to put in a high-quality solution. There are a lot of other contractors out there that don't put that into their bed, and they get this kind of surprise when they're ready to install the flooring about a week before the flooring goes down and now all of a sudden they have to spend anywhere from 
know, 50 cents a square foot to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten dollars a square foot. And that's a huge impact to their project. And essentially, they're the ones that either have to eat that or they do a change order to the owner. And the owner is generally not happy when they get that kind, that kind of change order. So these lead to other sorts of issues like mold and mildew, and then eventually to the, you know, the liabilities associated with foreign air failures. And from the contractor's perspective, here are kind of the issues that they run into. One is the environmental hazard of eventually down the road, if there is mold or mildew, having to remediate that and explain to the owner what the problem is. And then this leads to a, really a damaged reputation for them for future projects. There's a lot of liability out there in terms of actually who's going to pay for any fa failure later on in the project. Again, huge cost overruns, and from the contractor's perspective, big delays. And that big delay could be a week or two, but in today's construction market, a week or two is a huge impact to the project and a huge impact to the owner being able to come in and generate revenue. So some of the reasons that we're starting to see these changes, I kind of started off with the end game, the flooring failure, and let's just talk about some of these reasons. And really there's several of them. There's not just any one thing that has caused this problem, but we'll start off with talking about moving to low VOC adhesives, why that's happened, uh, some changes in the way that we are building buildings now versus maybe 15 years ago that everything's a little bit more accelerated. Briefly touch on moisture, because I think Ned is going to talk about that a little bit more, and we'll talk about the budget, even though we kind of touched on that here a little bit already. So the first thing is the switch to the low VOC adhesives. There are several reasons for this. Um, not any one of these is, uh, I guess, overruling than the other, although a lot of people will talk about the EPA ruling uh, to switch to low VOC adhesives. There's also some things that happened in California with the uh, air quality management uh, departments, and there's also some things that have happened with uh, the green building movement with developing lead credits. And this is a table here of now the VOC limits that you can have in a LEED certified project. And in the city of San Francisco, you can't do new construction of any size without having a LEED certified project. And you're just not allowed to use those high VOC glues that were a little bit more tolerant of moisture in concrete, or the moisture that is emitted from concrete, or the transmission from the soils beneath. So this is really part of the reason why we're starting to see a lot more problems, even though we've seen a lot of problems in the past as well. The other one is fast track construction. I just have a couple points here on a job that Turner DevCon is doing in the San Francisco Bay Area. If anybody is a San Francisco 49ers fan, this is actually some of the penalties that on that project that they would see that are working their way into all sorts of other projects. There's a lot more penalties and benefits driven from contract documents now in terms of project delay. So on this project, for example, there would be a $6 million fine, basically, to the general contractor team if they missed a 49ers game, and there's daily fines in the preseason, and the, the amount of that will have, you know, could eventually reach $20 million. Luckily, it looks like they're actually on pace and, in fact, ahead of schedule to finish that project. But the point of this is that there's a lot more going on with the contract documents that are being written for penalties for delay of a project. And on the flip side as well with the owner, the reason why that they have that is they want to start generating revenue in their building as soon as they can. And I've heard stories, and I'm not sure if they're really true stories, but I've heard stories that uh, a one real re retailer, 90 days after they break ground on one of their buildings, they want to have that building up and running and generating revenue. And it's, uh, it's quite fast paced to get a whole building, you know, I think that those are probably average 10,000 square feet, to get that kind of building up and running in 90 days. So on top of the low VOCs uh, adhesives that we're, that we're using now, having fast track construction doesn't help it at all anyways because you don't have the time for the concrete to dry and you're really pushed on your schedule as well in terms of any remediation that you may be able to come in and do. So I just want to briefly touch on the difference between emission and transmission to kind of set the stage for what these guys will be talking about. Emission is essentially the water that's in the concrete for the, the water of convenience for us to actually place and finish concrete slabs. And that emission is we basically would need maybe half of the water in the concrete to get enough strength. The other half is there for us to be able to pump, place, and finish. So the water that 
of convenience, which is the other half to pump, place, and finish, is not really going to be consumed. It's going to come out of the slab eventually. And the water of transmission is event essentially the water that could be in the soils, the moisture in the soils coming through the soil, through the concrete, and then eventually hitting the uh, finished surface or the, the flooring uh, system. Now, luckily, Eric will talk about how to get rid of the transmission problem by essentially putting in a vapor barrier and you get, take a, what we say, taking the ground out of play or taking the, the soil out of play. But we still have this issue of the moisture in the concrete causing flooring failures. And there are several ways to remediate that problem that Peter will talk about here. The, the last thing I'll kind of say that we've talked about a little bit is that the fact that we have these tight budgets. And basically what our contractor friend had, had told me is a lot of times they don't think about this dollar value until it's time to remediate. And this dollar value could be several dollars a square foot, which if you look at a project, a 10,000 square foot project, which is a couple million dollar project, to add another $20,000, thirty dollars to $40,000 onto that budget is very difficult. What we essentially need to do and what he suggests doing is moving that dollar value to the design stage and building it into the, uh, the specification or at least on the general contractor, the design build contractor that's doing the work is to put that into their bid as a contingency option and incorporate that into their contract documents. With that, I'm, I'm finished with my section. I'll